Hey, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. We are looking for more videos of viewers like you playing your shofar to put the opening and closing of our lessons. If you would like to submit a video, talk to your parents. There will be a link to a drive folder in the description below that you can upload to, or you can email them to us, trainedupintorah at gmail.com, or contact us on Facebook. All right, let's get going with this week's lesson. Shalom. Before we get going, I need you to pause the video and get your mom and dad for me. Hey parents, this week, this lesson might be a little difficult for some children. Please look at the subjects on the screen that will be discussed in this week's lesson and decide if this lesson is right for you and your family. These subjects will be discussed in the scripture story, so feel free to skip if this part isn't suitable for your children. Now, let's get going with our lesson. Hey guys, Shabbat Shalom. I'm so happy that you're here today. Please, please excuse my voice. I was, I really wanted to be here today, but I've had a cold this week and it's left me kind of nasally and, and my nose is just kind of running and, and I've got the sneezes, so please forgive me in advance in case I sneeze. Um, or, so did you have a good week? I haven't had the best of week. I've had a cold this week, but I'm almost over it. And I'm so excited because it's just in time for my family and I to go to the science center. We love the science center. We love seeing like the animals and things and I've waited all week. Um, so since I don't have a fever, I shouldn't be contagious. And so we're gonna go there tomorrow. And so I'm really excited for that. I am happy that the Sabbath is here though, because I really needed a rest with the rest of this cold. Anywho, Ooh, excuse me. Um, so you guys, today we're going to learn, uh, we're going to be reading and learning about Leviticus chapter 15. <laughs> and oddly enough, it's about discharges. But you know what? I don't know that it has anything to do with the cold, do you? Uh, it's just kind of funny that this is the chapter we have this week. Well, you guys, let's see what we have in store for you today. I know we have a song and some scripture and some other fun. And well, I'll see you here in a little bit, okay? Shema Israel, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad, Baruch Shem Kevod, Malhuto, Leolam Thank you, Father, for this wonderful day that you have made. We thank you so much for bringing us to another Shabbat and for Trinit Batora and for everyone who is taking part in this and all the children and families who are watching um, all over the world. And we thank you so much for your goodness to us, your mercy and your faithfulness, uh, for your many, many blessings and for showing us how to walk in your Torah, for giving us Yeshua who paid the price for our sins so we could be with you forever. And we thank you so much for just everything, for all you are to us. And we love you so much and pray that your presence would be with us in a special way um, this day and every day. We love you so much again, and we thank you. And pray all this in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. I have a song I'd like to share with you. And the name of this song is Uncleanness.
Shabbat Shalom. Wayakra, Leviticus 15, Statue for Cleansing Bodily Discharges Yahweh also spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, and say to them, When any man has a discharge from his body, his discharge is unclean. This, moreover, shall be his uncleanness in his discharge. It is his uncleanness, whether his body allows its discharge to flow or whether his body obstructs its discharge. Every bed on which the person with the discharge lies becomes unclean, and everything on which he sits becomes unclean. Anyone, moreover, who touches his bed shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. And whoever sits on the thing on which the man with the discharge has been sitting shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Also, whoever touches the person with the discharge shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Or if the man with the discharge spits on the one who is clean, he too shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Every saddle on which the person with the discharge rides becomes unclean. Whoever touches any of the things which were under him shall be unclean until evening, and he who carries them shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Likewise, Whomever the one with the discharge touches without having rinsed his hands in water shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. However, an earthenware vessel which the person with the discharge touches shall be broken, and every wooden vessel shall be rinsed in water. Now when the man with the discharge becomes cleansed from his discharge, then he shall count off for himself seven days for his cleansing. He shall then wash his clothes and bathe his body in running water, and will become clean. Then on the eighth day he shall take for himself two turtle doves or two young pigeons, and come before Yahweh to the door of the tent of meeting, and give them to the priest. And the priest shall offer them, one for a sin offering, and the other for a burnt offering, so that the priest shall make atonement on his behalf before Yahweh because of his discharge. Now if a man has a seminal emission, he shall bathe all his body in water and be unclean until evening. As for any garment or any leather on which there is a seminal emission, it shall be washed with water and be unclean until evening. If there is a woman with whom a man lies so that there is a seminal emission, they shall both bathe in water and be unclean until evening. If a woman has a discharge and her discharge in her body is blood, she shall continue in her menstrual impurity for seven days, and whoever touches her shall be unclean until evening. Everything also on which she lies during her menstrual impurity shall be unclean, and everything on which she sits shall be unclean. Anyone who touches her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. And whoever touches anything on which she sits shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Whether it be on the bed or on the thing on which she is sitting, when he touches it he shall be unclean until evening. If a man actually lies with her so that her menstrual impurity is on him, he shall be unclean seven days, and every bed on which he lies shall be unclean. Now if a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the period of her menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond that period, all the days of her unclean discharge she shall continue as though in her menstrual impurity. She is unclean. Any bed on which she lies all the days of her discharge shall be to her like her bed at menstruation and everything on which she sits shall be unclean, like her uncleanness from her menstrual impurity. Likewise, whoever touches them shall be unclean, and shall wash his clothes and bathe in water, and be unclean until evening. Now if she becomes clean from her discharge, she shall count off for herself seven days, and afterward she will be clean. Then on the eighth day she shall take for herself two turtle doves or two young pigeons and bring them in to the priest to the doorway of the tent of meeting. And the priest shall offer the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. 
so the priest shall make atonement for her on her behalf before Yahweh because of her unclean discharge. Thus you shall keep the sons of Israel separated from their uncleanness, so that they will not die in their uncleanness by making my tabernacle which is among them unclean. This is the law for the one with a discharge, and for the man who has a seminal emission, so that he is unclean by it, and for the woman who is ill because of menstrual impurity, and for the one who has a discharge, whether a male or a female, or a man who lies with an unclean woman. Hey guys, Shabbat Shalom. This is Miss Bethany here. I have a nature lesson for you today. In our chapter today, there was a verse that said, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When any man has a discharge from his flesh, his discharge is unclean. The definition of discharge is to relieve of charge or load or burden. And the second one is to pour forth a fluid or other contents. So an example would be um, a river discharges into the ocean. The first definition is sort of interesting because it seems to fit really well with our bodies and the things that it does at times. Does your stomach ever feel not very well? Or have you ever had some kind of uh, bump or injury that got full of liquid? Blech, <laughs> gross. Well, this does happen. And that means that something has happened in your body or to your body that makes it not very happy. Maybe you ate something that your body doesn't like, that you have an intolerance for, or maybe you have a sickness that is really upsetting your belly. Well, when this happens in a lot of cases, there are bad things in our bodies that need to get out. And in order to make us feel better, sometimes in order to rid our bodies of those toxins, we have to throw up. Thus, as the definition says, to relieve of charge, load, or burden. Your body is relieving you of the burden that that particular bad thing they got inside of you. Or what if you've had some sort of bump that fills with liquid? That's called pus. <laughs> Yuck. Pus occurs because our body is trying to battle some sort of infection or grime. It's actually made up of dead white blood cells. White blood cells fight infection. It's part of the way that your immune system fights off the bad guys but they can only fight for so long. Your immune system is part of your body that protects it from foreign substances, cells, and tissues by making the immune response. There is so very much that your immune system does, but that's just to sum it up really quick. White blood cells are also called leukocytes, and they are produced in the marrow of the bones. Neutrophils are a type of leukocytes, having a specific job at attacking the hurtful fungi and bacteria. So because of this, pus also contains dead bacteria. Bacteria means any of a domain of chiefly round, spiral, or rod-shaped, single-celled prokaryotic microorganisms that typically live in soil, water, organic matter, in the bodies of plants and animals that make their own food, especially from sunlight, or are saprophytic or parasitic. So basically, they're super small creatures that sometimes make you sick. They are so small that you can't even see them without a microscope. And fungi means any kingdom of saprophytic or parasitic spore producing eukaryotic, typically filamentous organisms formally classified as plants that lack chlorophyll. And this includes mold, rusts, smuts, mushrooms, and yeast, which to really narrow it down, they are all sort of the same as far as they are really small and sometimes sickness causing things that get into you. That being said, there are some good fungi and good bacteria as well. But with that, let's get back to our white blood cells. So microphages, these are another kind of white blood cells. It detects foreign substances and releases an alarm in small cell signaling protein molecules called cytokines. Cytokines tell the neutrophils and those neutrophils slip from the bloodstream into the area being attacked. The rapid buildup of neutrophils eventually leads to the existence of pus. So what exactly are white blood cells? Well, your blood is made up of red blood cells and white blood cells, platelets, and plasma. 
Your white blood cells make up only 1% of your blood, but their impact is so large. They keep you safe from illnesses and disease. In a sense, they're always at war. They go through your bloodstream to fight. When your body is in distress and a particular area is undergoing an attack, your white blood cells rush in to help destroy the substances causing you harm and to prevent sickness. White blood cells are stored in your blood and lymph tissues. Some white blood cells called neutrophils have a really short life. Actually, it's less than a day. So your bone marrow is always making more. There are several different types of white blood cells too. Firstly, monocytes. These have a longer lifetime than most white blood cells and they help break down bacteria. Then we have lymphocytes. They create antibodies to fight bacteria, viruses, and other invaders that could be harmful. The neutrophils, these kill and process bacteria and fungi. There are a greater amount of them than any other white blood cells. And they are your first line of defense when it comes to infection. These are the kind that live less than a day. Now we have basophils. These small cells create an alarm when infectious agents invade your blood. They thrust out chemicals such as histamine, which is a marker of an allergic disease. That helps to control your body's immune response. And lastly for today, eosinophils. These attack and kill parasites in cancer cells, and they also help with allergic responses. Well, that was a good bit to take in. So let's lean off of this scientific information for now. So when our bodies complain at us, it's because something's going on. Something isn't right. So we should listen to them because Yahweh made them to know far better on the inside than we do in our heads. So when we need to throw up or have a dead white blood cell filled infection, that sounds a little bit nicer than pus, right? Um, or even a runny nose, that's because we have a cold. And all of these things mean that something isn't quite right. That maybe we are sick or maybe our body is fighting something. So all of these things are what makes us unclean, which makes sense because none of them are good things. Scripture says that if anyone touches you when you have these things, then they are unclean. Maybe because your body is trying to get rid of the bad, and so now it's on them. Just like if you have a cold and you sneeze on someone, that spreads the germs that are inside of you all throughout the air and that will settle in different surfaces around you waiting to attack someone else when they touch you or they touch something that you've come in contact with. Okay, so today's nature lesson wasn't exactly um, elegant to listen to. But I do hope that it was useful for you and that you did learn something. I know I did. So I hope everybody has a wonderful Sabbath and Shabbat Shalom. Well, you guys, what did you learn from the chapter today? You may have thought some of that doesn't really apply to me. I'm still pretty young. I don't understand what this chapter means. And well, there's a lot to be said in that chapter. If you have any questions, I'm sure your parents would love to answer some of those for you guys. Um, you know what kind of stuck out to me though? It made me think of uh, it made me think of a science experiment when I was in school. So Leviticus 15, Leviticus 15, uh, verse. Where did it go? Ah, verse eight. This kind of stuck out to me. So it says that, and when he who has the discharge spits on him who is clean, spits. The rest of the the rest of the discharges and stuff talk about, you know, other bodily fluids and stuff like that. But I'd never really considered spit. You know, it's really gross to spit on somebody. Surely, surely that that doesn't mean someone spitting on you, like, you know, purposely. Uh, that seems really, really wrong. Um, but looking deeper, I was sitting here thinking, and it really, it jogged my memory and made me think when I was in seventh grade at school, we were in the science class and, and the teacher did an experiment. And she took this, um, she took an aerosol can of of air freshener, which was terrible because I'm super sensitive to smells and I was sitting right where she was. But the 
point of the experiment was there was about 25 to 30 of us in the class and we were spread out in this huge room and she stands by the door and she says okay we're going to show how things particles um smells but also just you know particles that are too small to see they travel through the air um and so she stood by the door and she said that once you smell the air freshener, raise your hand. So she sprays a good long spray for about three seconds or so. And then immediately the people, including myself by the door was like, we smell it, we smell it. <laughs> and it keeps going and it, it goes and it goes and more people are raising their hand. And after a couple of minutes, the people in the very back on the other side, they've had their hand raised they could also smell it. Even though it wasn't super strong or anything like that, but they could smell it. So it traveled that far. And it got me thinking, you know, when we sneeze and when we cough, um, sometimes, well, I think every time we sneeze or when we cough, there's spit that comes out and perhaps Perhaps that's what this is alluding to. What this, what maybe what this means, like maybe when you are sneezy and when you're coughing, you know, cause you want to cover, they always say cover your cough and cover your sneeze. And sometimes your hands might be full or um, they sneeze up on you <laughs> or, or some other reason, or it just gets between your fingers, you know, try to use your elbow, but there's still, generally there's still spit that goes into the air from your person. Now, a lot of times sneezing and coughing, uh, it makes you think of like, you know, something contagious, like a cold, or um, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's like a sinusy thing or allergies um, and things like that. But the point being, a Torah says, spit. And it got me thinking, I was really looking forward to our trip tomorrow but I'm still pretty sneezy and pretty coffee. <laughs> I'm coughing a lot. And I don't think, I don't think that it would be right for me to go. I don't think that it would be fair for me to go because even if I cover my mouth when I sneeze and when I cough, there's still particles in the air that are floating to other people that can't be seen and they can't avoid it. They can't get away from it. So I'm going to have to really think on it. Would that be the right thing to do? I'm not contagious. I'll cover my mouth. I really want to go. Well, we've got, we've got some more parts of our Sabbath school. Maybe it can clear some of this up. I don't know. I'm going to think of it some more. Uh, right now we've got uh, some history and Hebrew and a nature lesson. And well, you guys, I'll be back here when you get back. This is Miss Rachel, and it's time for Hebrew. So this time for Hebrew, we're going to do things a little bit differently. We are beginning a new year, and, um, and so I thought it would be pretty cool to go over some of the different names for the Hebrew days of the week and also for what year is and what day is. 
So if you look at this calendar, it says Aviv up here in the top. And that's because Yahweh said the first or the beginning of months for you, or in other words, the new year for you would begin in Aviv. It will begin in the springtime whenever the Israelites left Egypt. And so um, we have the name of the month here as Aviv. And each month has several weeks in it, usually around four weeks. And so this is a week. And how many days do we have in a week? Yes, yeah, so we have seven days in a week. That's right. And so we're going to learn the different names for the days of the week. We have the first day of the week, which is Yom Rishon. We have the second day of the week, which is Yom Sheni. We have the third day of the week, which is Yom Shlishi. We have the fourth day of the week, which is Yom Revi'i. The fifth day, Yom Hamashi. The sixth day, which is Yom Shishi, and then Shabbat. And we're gonna go over all of those a little bit slower so that everybody will be on the same page. Okay, so the name for year, or the word for year in Hebrew is Shana. Can you guys say that? Shana. And that means year in Hebrew. The word for week in Hebrew is Shavua. Shavua. And Shavua is based on the word seven in Hebrew. Can you guys guess why Shavua might be based on the word seven? Yes, because there are seven days in a week. That's right. So can you repeat after me? Shavua. Shavua. That means week. And then each week, as we said, has seven days. And the word for day in Hebrew is yom. Yom. Can you say that? Yom. Okay, so now we're going to learn the days of the week. So the first day of the week is Yom Rishon. Yom Rishon, and it literally means first day. Yom Rishon. The second day of the week is Yom Sheni. Yom Sheni. Can you say that? Yom Sheni. And that means second day. The third day of the week is Yom Shlishi. Yom Shlishi. Can you say that? Yom Shlishi. And I guess maybe you've noticed now that each of these days of the week starts with the word yom, which we said means day. So each of the days of the week has the word day in it or yom. The fourth day of the week is yom revi'i. Yom revi'i. Can you repeat that? Yom Revi'i. Good job. The fifth day of the week is Yom Hamashi. Yom Hamashi. Can you say that? Yom Hamashi. Okay, and the sixth day of the week is Yom Shishi. Yom Shishi. Can you say that? Yom Shishi. Okay, the last day of the week is, you guys tell me, what's the seventh day of the week called? That's right, Shabbat. And we just call that Yom Shabbat. So that's an easy one. Um, I do want to point out one more thing while we're talking about the days of the week. Most of the days of the week are based on the number. So 
Shani is based on the number two. Shlishi is based on the number three, which is Shalosh in Hebrew. Revi'i is based on the number four. Hamishi is based on the number five, which is Hamesh in Hebrew. Shishi is based on the number six, which is Sheish in Hebrew. Some of these are a little bit more of a stretch, but Yom Rishan and Shabbat are different. So Yom Rishan is based on the word Rosh, which means head. And that is the word that we use for first day, but we call the first day or the first of something, the head of something. And so just like the new year in Hebrew is called Rosh Hashanah, it's the head of the year or the new year. The same thing with the first day of the week. It's Rishon based on the word Rosh, which is head. And then of course, Shabbat is not a number. It is, it means to, to stop, to rest, and um, we know because on Shabbat, we're supposed to stop our work and rest. So I thought you guys would find that pretty cool. And let's move on. Okay, and now it's time to review the words that we've learned. So I will show you the word in Hebrew and in English and say the word. And then if you know what it means, you just shout out the meaning. You ready? Let's go. Shana, Shana. Do you remember what that one means? Shana. That means year. Shavua, Shavua. Sometimes we say Shavua Tov. That's a little hint for you. And Shavua means week. Good job. Yom. Yom. What does Yom mean? Hmm. Day. That's right. And now we have the days of the week. Yom Rishon. Yom Rishon. What does Yom Rishon mean? That's right. First day. Shani, Yom Shani. What did that one mean? Good job, second day. Yom Shlishi, Yom Shlishi. What was that one? That's right, third day. Yom Revi'i, Yom Revi'i. And that one is fourth day. Yom Hamashi, Yom Hamashi. Do you remember that one? Fifth day, that's right. Yom Shishi, Yom Shishi. Do you remember what that was? day. Excellent. One more. Yom Shabbat. Yom Shabbat. What was that one? Yes. Yom Shabbat means the day of Shabbat. Good job, everybody. Okay, and just for fun, I decided to put some greetings up here using the words that you just learned. So if you would like to know how to say, have a great new year, you would say Shana Tova, Shana Tova. And if you've ever wanted to know how to say happy birthday, it's Yom Huledet Sameach, Yom Huledet Sameach. And happy new moon is Rosh Chodesh Sameach, Rosh Chodesh Sameach. And then Shavua Tov means have a great week. So on that note, I hope you guys have a great week. 
Shavua Tov. And Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, trained up in Torah friends. This is Joe with your history lesson. In Leviticus 15.12, we read, And the earthen vessel which he who has the discharge touches has to be broken, and every wooden vessel has to be rinsed in water. What kind of earthen vessels do you think Israel might have brought out of Egypt? In ancient Egypt, pottery was very important, as the Egyptians used clay pottery for many things in their households. From lamps to jars, large and small, that held water, wine, milk, cheese curds, butter, and beer. They also made cups and bowls and many other things. Egyptian tombs are often decorated with artwork depicting people collecting clay from the banks of the Nile to make bricks and pottery. The clay used in ancient Egyptian pottery is found in three locations along the bank of the Nile River. Nile clay is typically reddish brown when fired. It contains little pieces of sediment from all of the places near the Nile River that have washed down during floods. It contains high amounts of silicon and iron oxide that give it such a warm reddish brown tone. Marl clay is much lighter in color than regular Nile clay. It contains a lot of slate and limestone and is higher in calcium than the darker red clay. It is found between Esna and Cairo, Egypt. Cairo is near the pyramids of Giza. Marl clay becomes creamy in color when it is fired in an oxygen rich oven. This clay contains high amounts of mineral salts that make the surface of the kilned clay appear light in color, while cuts in the clay reveal pink to orange tones in the clay. When fired at high temperatures of nearly 2000 degrees Fahrenheit, the mineral salts on the surface can become greenish. Kina clay is a kind of marl clay that comes from the sediment from the wadi kina that is mixed with the limestone and slate. One of the coolest kinds of ancient Egyptian pottery is called a kula. It is a porous clay pot that is coated in marl clay. That allows water to seep through tiny holes onto the exterior surface where the water is then evaporates and cools the air. It's an air conditioner. Some still use kulas today. They work best in places with dry air. To increase the cooling, people wrap the pot in a wicking fabric and put it in a place where a breeze can blow over it. The Egyptian kula, also called a zir pot, became the inspiration for our modern air conditioner. In the United States, patents from 1945 for air cooling units used the same basic design. Egyptians used a thin layer of darker Nile clay to seal their pots so they could hold wine and other liquids. The ancient Egyptians also had a version of a food cooler or dessert refrigerator that used both kinds of pots, using a largest porous pot to hold water and a smaller sealed pot inside that held things like butter or fruit in the middle. They covered it with a wet wicking cloth and put it in the shade where there was a breeze, or else slaves would fan it with large dried palm fronds. You might be surprised to learn that these nesting pot coolers can even make ice if the conditions are just right. In recent times, they have come back into use for regions that lack resources such as electricity. When the children of Israel left Egypt, they were probably carrying a lot of their things in pottery made from Nile clay. Well, that's all for today. I hope you liked this lesson. Shabbat Shalom! Shabbat Shalom, my trained up in Torah friends. I'm Miss Deanna. For our moral story today, I would like to tell you a little bit about my childhood. When I was growing up, my mom was a professional baker. She still is. She has made thousands of fancy cakes for all kinds of special events, including weddings, anniversaries, birthdays, and baby showers. It was a lot of fun helping my mom make beautiful decorations out of sugar, frosting, fondant, gum paste, and chocolate. Do those things sound yummy to you? In our house, we had two kitchens so that she could cater the meals for those special events. She's an amazing cook. Have you ever been to a bakery where the bakers wear special white clothes, hats, and hairnets? Why do you think they wear those special clothes? Did you guess that it's because they want to be clean? When we wear white, is it easier to see if we get something on our clothes? It is. When someone is making food for other people, it's extremely important to be very clean. The kitchen and all of the equipment used for cooking has to be washed and sterilized. Whenever a big event like a wedding was coming up, my mom would clean and disinfect every surface from the ceiling to the floor so that there wasn't any dust left in the kitchen. 
A tiny piece of clothing lint could ruin a sugary creation that she had spent hours on. Everything had to be as perfectly clean as possible. And everyone who was helping had to be healthy. So as the dates for events got closer, my mom would ask all of our friends to refrain from coming over if they even thought they might be getting sick. And they would lovingly wait to come until they were healthy again. Do you think it made our friends feel a little sad when they heard that they had to stay away until they were all better? Do you think my mom was trying to hurt their feelings? Or was she really just protecting the wedding guests from getting sick? If you guessed that she was protecting the wedding guests, you are correct, and our friends were very understanding. Can you already guess how this connects to our passage today? Just like the bakers who wear special clothing and keep a super clean kitchen, the priests had special clothing, and all of the items in the tabernacle of Yahuwah's dwelling where they served were cleansed and set apart. If anyone was sick or had some other discharge came into that set apart place, would they have made the whole place unclean? Yes, they would have. Do you remember the reason it was important for the children of Israel to be clean when they came into the tabernacle and for the priests to make atonement for them? Leviticus 15.31 says, Thus you shall separate the children of Israel from their uncleanness, lest they die in their uncleanness when they defile my dwelling place which is in their midst. Whatever touches an unclean person becomes unclean as well. So coming into Yahuwah's presence while unclean would cause his dwelling place to be defiled. To protect his people from dying in their uncleanness, Yahuwah instructed them to stay away from his dwelling place until they had been cleansed. Then they would bring an offering and the priests would make atonement for them. In previous chapters, we learned about how all of the items in the tabernacle were cleansed and set apart before they were used in Yahuwah's dwelling place. It was very important to obey all of Yah's instructions in these matters because He is holy and set apart. Nothing that is unclean or sinful can be in His presence. Our sin must be atoned for, and we must be clean to be in His presence. It's important to remember that all of His instructions are for our good, and He is patient, kind, and merciful. In Scripture, the word unclean is used many different ways. And we have to think about the words around it when we want to understand how it is being used. Our sin is called uncleanness, but not all uncleanness is a sin. In today's chapter, we read about people who were unclean because they got something yucky on them. A few weeks ago, we learned about animals that are unclean to eat. These are different. And being unclean because you got dirty is not a sin. But it is something that you need to be cleansed of before going to the tabernacle. However, if someone approached the dwelling place in their uncleanness, that would be a sin because it would be disobedience. It's the disobedience that is a sin, not getting something yucky on you to begin with. All of the things that were set apart for use before Yah were to be respected and kept holy and undefiled. By giving them instructions to protect them, Yahuwah was showing his love for his people. By obeying Yahuwah, the Israelites were showing their love for him. Today we cannot go to the tabernacle to give our offerings, but we still follow all of Yah's instructions and commandments that apply to us. Today, Yahusha, or Yahshua, he is our high priest and he atones for our sin. He gets to sit at the Father's right hand in heaven above. Just like the Israelites in the desert, we can show our love and respect for Yahuwah and His Son, whom He sent to be our Messiah and to take our sins away. We can show this by our obedience. Yahusha said in John 14, 21, He who possesses my commandments and guards them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me shall be loved by my Father, and I shall love him and manifest myself to him. That's all for today, kids. Always remember that Yahuwah loves you and all of his ways are love. Shabbat Shalom. Oh, hey, you guys. Have you guys been enjoying Sabbath school so far? I really hope so. Well, I did think about it. 
as much as I don't want to disappoint my family, I'm going to have to sit out the science center tomorrow. I don't feel right going and knowing that I'm sneezing and it's not really preventable at this point. I think that I'll rest a day and if I'm still sneezing in the morning or if I'm still froggy in my throat and coughing, then I think I'm just going to have to stay home tomorrow and go another time. I think that's what Yahweh would want me to do. Well, you guys, there was a lot to unpack in this chapter. I hope you got something out of it today. Um, that even if the other fluids and discharges don't apply to you at this time, if you've never, if you haven't started your period or anything else that it touched on, um, that you can at least think about like when you have a cold um, and you have snot. <laughs> And when you're coughing and just you're spitting, maybe maybe we could all be more mindful that when we go out um, or when we're not feeling our best or even when we feel fine and we're just kind of sneezy and our noses are itching and, you know, you just kind of have those days sometimes because there are people who their immune systems don't work as well. They don't. Um, I have friends like that. I have family like that. And they're more susceptible to cold. So even though you may not think that you are contagious because um, you don't have a fever, uh, it, it's better, I think, to stay home and just to, to be protective and be mindful of other people too. Um, because it's not good when some of these people catch colds. They do their best to not catch colds. But if you are knowingly sneezing and and, and passing those particles into their air that you're sharing with them. Um, and it can be avoided. I think it's best to do that, right? So you guys stay home when you're not feeling well because I'm staying home tomorrow too. Oh goodness, you guys, that's all for me today. I'm gonna go rest and lay it down, but don't go anywhere. We have some more fun for you. Uh, we have another song and uh, I think a craft and a snack and some other goodies, so. You guys, I hope you enjoy the rest of your Sabbath. If you're sick also, I hope that you feel better. And um, I hope that you have a blessed week ahead of you. Shalom.
Shabbat Shalom, everyone. This is Miss Shannon with a new memory verse for you. This week we have 2 Corinthians 7 1. Let's take a look at it right now. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of Elohim. 2 Corinthians 7 1. Wonderful! Now that we've looked over that, let's begin practicing memorization. Remember to pause the video if you need more time to fill in the blanks. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of Elohim. 2 Corinthians 7 1 Wonderful! Now let's try again. Pause the video again if you need more time. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of Elohim. 2 Corinthians 7 1. Very well done! Now it's that part of the video! It's time to try and recite your memory verse. Again, pause if you need more time to think about it, and don't worry if you don't get it all right the first time. Just see your best! Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of Elohim. 2 Corinthians 7 1. Woohoo! Congratulations on a job well done! Now it's time for us to discuss our memory verse. The topic of our chapter today, and of much of Leviticus, has a lot to do with cleanness and uncleanness. We often feel that the ceremonial laws, as they're called by some, are mostly confined to Leviticus and not talked about very much in other places in the Bible, especially in the New Testament. However, we actually do see uncleanness being listed with several other vices in the New Testament. Could this uncleanness be referring to when you get dirty playing outside? Hmm, I think it has more to do with the kinds of uncleanness that we were reading about today, don't you? The Bible really is one big book with the same author. Today's verse actually sums up a lot of what the Bible tells us to do, to be clean and holy on the inside and the outside. Alright, with that, here's your memory verse for this week. Remember to keep practicing it as much as you need. Have an especially wonderful and blessed week, and Shabbat Shalom! Shabbat Shalom. We are making slime for today's craft. So you're going to need contact solution, Elmer's glue, baking soda, and food coloring if you choose to color yours. So grab all of those materials and let's get started. You are going to empty your bottle of glue into a bowl. You are going to go ahead and add your food coloring next. Make sure you don't add anything else first, just glue and food coloring, and you're going to mix it really really well this makes sure that your slime is going to have a uniform color next we're going to go ahead and dump in our baking soda stir that really really well make sure you don't have any big clumps of dry bits of baking soda left we want to make sure that it's all incorporated in there next we're going to go ahead and add in our contact solution now the contact solution, if your slime is a bit too runny or slimy, you can always add a little bit more and that will help firm it up. Now fair warning, when you go to first mix this, it's gonna be sticky, stick on your hand, stick to the bowl. Simply all you gotta do though is keep mixing and then rub the slime along the bowls like I did and that just kind of pulls it right off of the bowl and into your big ball of slime. Now once you've mixed it really well, you're all set. Now you have your slime to play with. You can stretch it. You can roll it. 
whatever you desire. I hope you guys had fun with our craft today. Shabbat Shalom. So for our snack today, we are going to have cootie cookies. So scripture today was all about things that we needed to do in order to be healthy and clean. And y'all has these rules for a reason. So I thought it would just be a fun little play on words for everyone to be able to make cootie cookies, you know, Jeremy cookies and all of that. So pick your favorite cookie recipe, anything that has any fill-ins. It can be oatmeal raisin. It can be chocolate chips, your favorite candy, whatever you want, whatever your favorite cookie is that you have something in there that you can see it, blueberries, fruits, anything, and make your own favorite little cootie cookie with your family. Well, we hope that you guys have a blessed Shabbat. Shabbat Shalom. Yahweh, I thank you for this day. Thank you for all the people who are working on Shabbat school. Please let us have a good week. And please let everything go well. And please let, so please let everybody learn about the Bible. In Yeshua's name, hallelujah. Shabbat Shalom. I have a song I'd like to share with you. And it's called... <laughs> I haven't named it yet. Okay. <sighs> okay. Shabbat Shalom. I have a song I'd like to share with you. And the name of this song is Our Uncleanness. Shabbat Shalom. I have a song I'd like to share with you. And the name of this song is Uncleanness. Oh, that's the pink and white from you. Okay. Shabbat Shalom.